So your challenge then is to find me a textual variant that compromises a fundamental doctrine of the Christian faith. Okay, the heretic wants to do that. Come, 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 come. No, we're not, we're not That's ad hominem, by the way. We're not Richard. Okay. So here's what he's going to do. He's going to find a textual variant that compromises a fundamental doctrine of the Christian faith. Yeah. Now, when you say the Christian faith, I'm not contradicting the, the Christian faith. I'm contradicting orthodoxy, an orthodox doctrine, which is not the Christian faith. So one orthodox doctrine, which I will counter, is not part of the Christian faith, is imputed righteousness. Imputed righteousness is something which the Calvinists hold to, which says that when God looks at a person, a Christian, he doesn't see the Christian, doesn't see their life and all their sin, he just sees Christ. And so, they, so the teaching is that when we give our sins to Jesus, which is what I believe, and he takes them away, also Jesus somehow gives his righteousness to us. So we have this covering of righteousness. So whatever we do, whether we die in sin, because we've had this once for all salvation, we can go to heaven even though we've committed sin since salvation and we've not repented of it. That is false teaching, but it's orthodox. It's called imputed righteousness. Now, when the first translation that Tyndale did, he doesn't, he talks about the true faith, the true righteousness, which is imparted righteousness. When we believe in Jesus, he actually makes us righteous. And so he uses the word, the righteousness that springs from faith. So it's an actual righteousness. Because we've been forgiven our sins, we actually genuinely love people, we love God, and we want to do good, and we want to bless people. And so we go about actually doing good, and we will be judged for those things on the day of judgment. As it says in Revelation, the book shall be opened, and the people shall be judged according to the things written in the book, according to their deeds. Not they were covered by some imputed righteousness, regardless of their deeds, which is what imputed righteousness states. So I'll read you the passage as it is in Tyndale. I think all things but lost for the excellent knowledge sake of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have counted all things lost and do judge them but don't, that I might win Christ and might be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, so that's the old Jewish righteousness by uh, fulfilling the law, but that righteousness which springs of the faith which is in Christ. So he has an actual righteousness that comes from faith. I mean the righteousness which comes of God through faith in knowing him and the virtue of his resurrection and the fellowship of his passions, suffering, that I might be conformable unto his death. Now that was changed. The King James translators had this translation. They chose to change it and they inserted imputed righteousness by, by fudging the whole issue of this clear teaching that's in the Greek and in Tyndale that he has a righteousness that naturally springs from his faith in Christ. So, allow, 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 me, allow me to reply to the bro. Allow this me to is reply. Not, this is not undermining... Wait, did I interrupt you? No, sorry. Okay, so allow me to reply. Firstly, Christians believe that God is the one that saves us, that we do not save ourselves. Do you agree? Do you believe that the Bible teaches that? Yes. Okay, great. And the way that God does this is through His grace. Do you believe that? Yes, you might have a different understanding of grace, but yes. And it, does the Bible teach that? Yes. Okay, and that because our faith will bear fruit. The, yes. yes. Does the Bible teach that? Yes. Do Christians believe that? I don't know what Christians believe. There's, there's so, millions of people. The, the, the fact of the matter is, the way that Christians describe, the way that Christians describe the work of Christ and salvation, there's many different metaphors that are used by Christians. The brother is challenging one. He's challenging the Calvinist metaphor. This idea, this idea that that God looks upon a sinner and sees Christ. I want to say I've got no problem with that. But I also want to say, I also want to say that that isn't the only way that Christians have described the work of Christ. Where's your, the sorry, earliest, where's your scripture for that? Why, why are you interrupting? Sorry, I'm Did I interrupt you? If you interrupt me again, the next time you speak, I'll be shouting over you. So bear yourself. Now, Christians in the early church fathers, describe Christ as a physician 
who comes and heals the sickness of the human heart and makes us whole. The Church Fathers describe Christ as a conqueror who conquers the sin that has trapped us as an enslaved us and sets us free. Christ is described as one who ransoms us by paying the debt that is owed for our sin, for our falling short that we accrue towards God. All of these things, all of these things are legitimate descriptions of what God has done and so is what the Calvinists teach. This idea that when God looks at man, and it was actually I think Luther that taught it first, but when God looks at man and his sinfulness, he sees Jesus covering him. I don't see a problem with that and I haven't seen the textual variant that demonstrates it. All you've done is say Tyndale and the King James. They're both English. A textual variant has to appear in the Greek, which means you've got to show me a textual variant in the Greek to make your case. Can you do that? Right. First of all, the examples that you gave were all to do with um, Jesus taking away sin. And uh, the Bible teaches clearly that Jesus takes away sin. He's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Amen. Um, you, you have, I don't feel that you've dealt with the issue of imputed righteousness. Imputed righteousness is something that is taught by Calvin and is in the orthodoxy of reformed religion, but it's not in the Bible, apart from the King James. It can be um, extrapolated from uh, Philippians uh, chapter 3 in the King James, which is a kind of fudgy, vague way of dealing with this whole business of righteousness, okay? Having a righteousness uh, not of my own, that's what Paul says. And what the King James does, it fudges it so that the Calvinistic theologians can say, what Paul means is the righteousness of faith is um, God has given you Jesus' righteousness, so you don't actually have any righteousness, but you have this covering of Jesus' righteousness. So even though you don't do anything righteous, you're covered. So on the day of judgment, you're all right. Now that is not in scripture. Okay, That's can I reply, Richard? Richard is arguing that there's a textual variant between the King James and the Tyndale that affects the theology of Calvin. Yep. That is not the challenge that I laid down that he said he could prove. Well, no, because I didn't hear the original challenge. The, well, maybe you should have listened. Well, the challenge that I said was, show me a textual variant in the Greek that affects the fundamental doctrines of the Christian faith. But even though I am not a Calvinist, permit me to defend my Calvinist brothers and sisters, because I think that they have biblical justification for their metaphorical description. Let me read Romans chapter 4. What then shall we say that Abraham our forefather, according to the flesh, is found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessings on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. It is God saving through and through. It is God giving us righteousness, not because of what we have done, but because what he has done. Right, can I answer that? I, I agree with that passage, I've got it here. Even as David describes the blessedfulness of man unto whom God ascribeth righteousness without deeds. Blessed are they whose unrighteousness is forgiven. So that's about forgiveness at the point when a sinful person, whatever their background, comes to God and repents. At that point, God forgives and considers them righteous. Amen. Yeah. As we go on in the Christian life, we have to then show fruit. Yes. Right. Calvinists believe that. 
Yeah, but they, what they what they um, ameliorate is Ro Revelation 20, which they cannot an answer, which says um, that the everyone was judged according to their deeds. Yeah? The books were opened and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged of those things which were written in the books according to their deeds. Yeah. So we have to bear fruit as Christians, yes. an actual righteousness that springs from faith. But so why did the Geneva Bible translators change Tyndale? That's what I want to know. Bro, Why didn't this they? Is, this they is left not other the, passages. The question that we, we, we were dealing with. Yeah. The okay. question. So, and, and furthermore, I would like to suggest to you that in all my study of Calvinism, I've never met a Calvinist who says that a Christian won't bear fruit. Every Calvinist that I've met says that if you have true faith, it will bear fruit. So it seems to me that you're arguing a, a, a non sequitur argument, a non plus argument, because you're saying you're suggesting. That, that Calvinists are saying that you don't have to bear fruit. That's what they say. No, what they say actually is that if you have true faith, you can't do anything but bear fruit. That's but, their position. Yeah, but what actually happens? Oh, yes. Yeah, but what happens in reality, if you've been in a Calvinistic setting, is that you'll find people who aren't bearing fruit, and rather than saying there's no fruit in their life, they will try and ameliorate their sinful behaviour by saying that they're covered with the blood of Jesus. So it provides a way out for people who don't bear fruit. No, I, I don't believe that that's true because Calvinists would say that if you don't live the life that demonstrates the fruit of true faith, you're not one of the elect, you're not one of the saved. There, there is, that is what they say. So you're misrepresenting Calvinists and you're doing it because your heresy has twisted oh, your theology against the true faith Sorry, so much that you can't you don't believe in the Trinity. Okay. That you do that you can't see the good in those churches. Calvinists don't teach what you're suggesting that they do. What they teach is that when you have true faith, you can't do anything else except bear fruit. And I and I bet you there'll be Calvinists that support what I'm saying underneath. Yeah, that's You're what they say. Yeah, that's exactly what they teach. But if you go to if you go to many churches that have this teaching, you will see that in the pews and in the lives of the leaders as well, there is not holiness. There's that's a immorality. Generalization. There is immorality taking Total place. Total generalization. I'm not to judge. But if somebody's if somebody's repeatedly marrying, if they're fornicating, if they're um, uh, embezzling money and then they excuse it with imputed righteousness. Can you show me, Richard? They, they've got an excuse Richard. in the King James Version, Richard, Richard. which they wouldn't have if they used the Can you there. show me any Calvinist teacher that says that it's okay to repeatedly marry, that it's okay to fornicate, that it's okay to embezzle? Can you name the Calvinist teacher that teaches what you just said that they do? Right, you keep saying what Calvinists say. I'm not talking about what Calvinists say. I'm saying what happens in reality in churches which is excused. No. Using imputed righteousness. I, you've just said, that's the point. You've just said it's excused. So I'm asking you, show me the Calvinist teacher that excuses embezzlement, repeated marriage and fornication. No. Well, you said it was excused. Yes, well, you, all you have to do, I don't have to give you examples, you just need to look at churches across America, across the West, where sin is rampant. Sin is rampant because humans are sinners, bro. Yeah, but then they're told it's okay because you've got a free ticket to heaven because you made a one-time confession, a one-time profession, and now you're covered with the imputed righteousness of Jesus. That's what actually happens. No, that is and not people who are watching this, who, who not have their own experiences of this, will can decide for themselves. So, so Richard has gone and Richard has gone and stereotyped. Apparently, the whole of the Calvinist branch of Christianity. I am not a Calvinist. No, I am not a Roman Catholic. I am not an Orthodox. <laughs> but I'm going to defend my Calvinist brothers and sisters. Why? Because Christians need to start showing solidarity amongst one another and not sectarianism. So I'm going to defend the Calvinists. Because here's what the Calvinists would really teach. They would teach from Romans chapter 6. And this is what they would say. They would say, reading from verse 15, what then? Because it goes on to talk about the righteousness of God and how Jesus has brought a people to himself. And then from verse 15, it says in response to this, what then? 
Shall we sin because we are no, we are not under the law but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? This is what the Calvinists would teach. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to, to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. That's what the Calvinists would teach. Well, hang on. I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. The Calvinists teach the doctrine of sanctification. The idea that the Holy Spirit changes you into the Imatio Deo, into the Imatio Christo, so that you look like Christ on earth. This is what the Orthodox Church calls theosis. It what the Roman Catholic Church calls divinization. It is the idea that through the working of the Holy Spirit, we become like God on earth. The Calvinists teach it, the Orthodox teach it, the Catholic teach it. They use different words, they use different metaphors, they use different analogies, but they teach the same essential truth. Well, I'll have to differ with you there. I mean, you quoted a big passage of scripture, which I agree with, because it's in scripture. You didn't actually defend imputed righteousness. Um, you didn't. You didn't use any um, of the teachings of, of the Calvinists on imputed righteousness, and you haven't shown imputed righteousness here. This doesn't. This passage doesn't show imputed righteousness. It says at the end, "But now are you delivered from sin and made the servants of God, and have your fruit that should be sanctified." Stop interrupting. Stop being rude. Stop being rude. Ad hominem. Stop being rude. Bit of, a bit of hate going on. I am Muslim, by the way. But now are you delivered from sin and made the servants of God and have your fruit that you should be sanctified and the end of everlasting life. So this is saying here that we have to show fruit. This is not a Calvinist saying you have to show fruit. This is Paul writing to the Romans saying you have to show fruit. Now, Bob is saying that the Calvinists would agree with that. Well, of course they would agree with that because it's in Scripture. So I'm not. that isn't a defense of Calvinism. What you have to do is you have to look at the, what's going on in churches across the West where sin is taking place and you have to explain that to me. There are good Christians and there are bad Christians. There are the elect and there are the unelect. I'm going to try and defend it like a Calvinist even though I'm not a Calvinist. So here's how I think a Calvinist would defend it. There is the elect that God by predestination and his sovereign will is bringing to salvation and they can do nothing else but bear the fruits and the works according to the salvation wrought by God. And then there are the unelect who attach themselves to the elect. And they don't produce the fruits of salvation and the works of righteousness according to faith. And you're just simply pointing to the fact that there are some bad Christians and then dismissing the entirety of the Calvinist church. Brother, I bet you in your kind of heretical fellowships, we can find good Christians and bad Christians. Some Christians who live according to the faith and some Christians who don't live according to the faith. I'm putting Christians there in quote marks because the brother's not a Christian. But in any group of people, there are those that live well according to their principles and those that don't. Now I'm just going to speak for myself, not as a Calvinist. I don't believe in this hard predestination and this, art, this hard idea of election. I believe in the idea of freedom, the free will of man that can either cooperate or resist the grace of God. That it is actually the grace of God that permits any cooperation. But that we allow the Holy Spirit to work through us or we resist the work of the Holy Spirit. And where we allow the Holy Spirit to work through us, we bear the fruits of righteousness. And that these fruits of righteousness, like helping the orphan, helping the widow, helping the poor, 
um, standing up for justice, standing up for the persecuted, resisting caliphates, resisting Marxists, resisting Nazis, your buddies, those kinds of groups. We, your, your friends with the Dawah team, the people that would make us all dimmies. Now, the, the thing is, the thing is, the thing is, as Christians, I believe that if we allow our spirit to give way to the working of the Holy Spirit, we will bear the fruits of righteousness. And God will judge those fruits, not for our salvation. That's already been wrought and won by Jesus Christ and we can add nothing to it. Amen. However, when we go to heaven, we will be rewarded for our works. And if we do not perform the works of righteousness, we will still go to heaven because of what Jesus has done, but we will pass through like fire, pass through as if by fire, a trial, a judgment on what we have built our lives upon. And though we might be saved, we will suffer a loss because we didn't live as good Christians. That's my position. Uh, okay, well, thank you for that. I believe in free will as well. Um, but he says here that he that is righteous, let him be more righteous. Yes. He amen. that is holy, let him be more holy. Amen. He that doeth evil, let him do evil still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. Behold, I come shortly, my reward is with me, to give every man according as his deeds shall be. Yes. Jesus is no respecter of persons. Because somebody calls himself a Christian and says that they had a one-time salvation experience, if they are filthy, they will continue to be filthy. If they are evil, they'll be evil. If they, but if they are righteous, he says here, let them be more righteous. If they are holy, let them be more holy. Because Jesus will judge us according to our deeds. He is no respecter of persons. Regardless of what we say and whatever we might make our testimony to be, Jesus will judge us according to our deeds. And this is what is being ameliorated, what is being watered down by teachings like imputed righteousness, which say, don't worry, you're covered. And because people have that false assurance that they don't need to worry, they don't repent. And they don't continue to repent. And they don't continue to ask for the blood of Jesus to cleanse them, because they think they're all right because of imputed righteousness. My argument is actually not with Bob, it's with people who have that teaching, which I can see he doesn't, you probably have, I don't know, but the thing is, they can use the King James Version to justify it. Can I reply? So Richard jumped into this conversation when I laid out a challenge to show me a textual variant that compromises a fundamental Christian doctrine. And what he showed me was a textual variant of translations, the King James and the Tyndale. It's completely irrelevant to the question and the challenge that I asked because to show a textual variant that compromises a fundamental Christian doctrine, he's got to show it me in Greek, which he has not been able to do. Secondly, he has to establish that the doctrine of imputed righteousness is a fundamental Christian doctrine. I would suggest, some people. I would suggest that Christ as Saviour is the fundamental Christian doctrine. Calvinists believe that Christ is the Saviour. Catholics believe that Christ is the Saviour. The Orthodox Church believes that Christ is the Saviour. The Copts believe that Christ is the Saviour. The dispute is how? And that is a secondary doctrine. It isn't, no one is disputing that it's Jesus, and no one is disputing that it's Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. Every Christian agrees. But I believe that. It is but I'm also, a it is about, it is, the, the, his argument is about how that is communicated to us, which is a secondary doctrine. So neither in the first way nor the second way has he demonstrated a textual variant that criticizes a fundamental Christian doctrine. You are a heretic because you do not believe in the Trinity. That is what makes you a heretic. Well, you just said the fundamental faith as the basis of Christian faith is believing in Jesus and in him crucified, which I agree with. That's what Paul says. I sought to, ha to know nothing else but Christ and him crucified. That is the basis of Christian faith according to the Bible. It doesn't say anything in the Bible that you need to believe in the Trinity in order to be a Christian or be accepted by God. Thankfully, 
I believe in the Bible. So I know that I'm accepted because I believe in Christ and Him crucified. And although people can label me and twist, use loaded words against me, I'm not, I'm not shaken by that because I know whom I believe. I know whom I, 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 who has saved me, who has sanctified me, and who is changing my life. I know that in reality. My life has changed. So allow me to reply. Um, Richard says he believes in the Bible. Okay. What he meant to say is he believes in the Tyndale Bible. Ah, okay. That's what he really meant to say. Yes, I Because uh, there you go. I'm not lying. I'm not yeah. misrepresenting him. Unfortunately, he's got some problems there. One, the Bible that he believes in was put together by the Catholic Church. All of the 27 books of the New Testament were selected by the Catholic Church. A church that he rejects. That church believed in the Trinity before it had put the Bible together that he believes in. Erasmus. It was Catholics that translated the Bible. He mentioned Erasmus. Erasmus was a Catholic. Obviously everybody was a Catholic. There you go. Thank you very much. So I'm not lying. Everyone so, at that time was a Catholic. Richard, I did not interrupt you. Okay. Don't interrupt me. Otherwise, I just have to shout. And I would rather have a conversation because when I shout, you start complaining. So don't interrupt. Now, don't put me down. Now, now, stop interrupting and then I won't need to shout. So, in terms of the, the, the doctrines of the faith, the church that put together the Bible he believes in was the church that believed in the Trinity. 2,000 years of Christian testimony believes in the Trinity. Luther believed in the Trinity. Calvin believed in the Trinity. Tyndale believed in the Trinity. And Tyndale translates the book that he believes in. What you have in Richard is a man swept up in pride. He is swept up in his own intellectual pride, like every heretic always is. Because he is saying that all the great Christians of the Magisterium, all the great Christians of the Reformation, all the great Christian church fathers, all the great Christian no, theologians, that. they were all wrong. Oh yes, they were. There you go. The ah. They were all <laughs> wrong. The magisterial the they, were all, they were all wrong. Oh, so and they were now. all wrong because Richard is right. Ah, okay. The Richard is right. Oh, no, now? no, because oh, you interrupted. Because, you have to squash me. Oh, oh, oh. because me Richard interrupted, what I will have to this? raise my voice to finish this? my point. And I don't get to make a point. You'll get to make your point after I finish mine, like we've been doing for the last 20 minutes. Relax, Richard. 40 minutes. 40 minutes. <laughs> no, the fact is, Richard is full of his own pride. Every other Christian, every great Christian of learning, they're all wrong. I'm right because I've got Tyndale's Bible. It doesn't wash Richard with anyone who knows the historical faith of the church. You need to have some humility and recognize that greater men than you have read the Bible, like Tyndale, have translated the Bible, like Tyndale, and believe in the Trinity, like Tyndale. Can I speak now? Yeah, of course you can. Oh, Richard. Okay, well, first of all, I want to say it's not 2,000 years. The people only spoke about the Trinity with Tertullian. He was the first person to talk about the Trinity. Um, there was no, nobody spoke about the Trinity before Tertullian. There's no mention before him of the Holy Spirit being a distinct member of the Trinity in the concert of the Trinity. There's no mention in the first 150 years, as far as I can tell from my reading, I'm not a scholar, I'm not a great man, as um, Bob says, these men who are greater than me. Yeah, they probably were greater than me. But my understanding is, for the first 150 years, nobody mentioned that the Holy Spirit was a distinct member of the Trinity, who was an, indi who was an individual personality. The understanding, from, my underst from, from what I've read, is the Spirit of Christ. When Jesus said, two or three are gathered together in my name, he said, I am in the midst. He didn't say the Holy Spirit's in the midst. But of course, the Holy Spirit is in the midst. Okay, so once again, Richard was able to speak without interruption. Let's see if he can permit me the same courtesy, the same gentlemanliness that he demands of others. Now, just think about the prayer that Jesus, the, the dialogue that Jesus gives between John 14 and John 
Uh, 16. I'm just going to focus in on the last bit. All right. Because Jesus says in verse 12 to 15, okay. I have many more things to say to you. So that's one person. I have many more things to say to you. But you cannot bear them now. But when he... Oh, that's a different person. When he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears. Now think about that for a second. If the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit are all the same person, who's listening to who? Who's listening to who? If they're all the same person, nobody's listening to anybody because there's nobody to listen to. But the Spirit is speaking the words that he hears. It goes on to say, he will speak. So that's another person. He will speak and he will disclose to you what is to come. He, that's the Holy Spirit, will glorify me. Oh my gosh, that's two persons, not one person. If Richard's theology was right, that should be, I will glorify myself. But he doesn't say that, he says, he will glorify me. Now, why will he glorify me? Because for he will take of what is mine. Now, if they're the same person, how can they take of what is mine? That surely I take of myself or I give to myself. But that isn't what Jesus says. He says, I will take, he will take of what is mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has, oh, that's one person, are mine. That's two persons. And therefore I said that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. So that's three persons. The, fa the Son has everything that the Father has and the Holy Spirit has everything that the Son has. So there is an equality between the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. They are not the same person. They don't do the same things in terms of salvation. Furthermore, Jesus says that in, in verse chapter 14, verse 16, I will ask the Father. Now surely that would be, I ask myself if they're the same person. Why would you ask someone unless they are the same, unless they're a different person? I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper another advocate so Jesus is one advocate and if you have another advocate how many advocates do you have two not one no what does he say in Romans 9 listen to this Romans chapter 8 reading from verse 26 in the same way the spirit also helps our weaknesses for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us. Intercession. What is intercession? Intercession is between when party A intercedes between party X and party Y. It's when you stand between two parties. So who is he interceding for? The Spirit of God is interceding for the believer. But who is he interceding to? Remember, Richard said he believes Father, Son and Holy Spirit are all God. So who is the Holy Spirit interceding to if he is the same person? I'm going to finish soon on this. Intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he, that's speaking of God the Father, who searches the hearts, knows the mind of the Spirit. Wait a minute. I thought the Father and the Spirit were the same person. So why is the Father searching the mind of the Spirit? Surely that's just searching his own mind. Why is he searching another person's mind? It's because he, the Holy Spirit, intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Hold on a minute. I thought the Spirit was the Father. How can the Spirit intercede to the Father 
according to the will of the Father, if he is the Father. The scriptures clearly teach that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Spirit is God, but these are not the same person. Right, your turn. Ah, okay. Richard. Okay. Okay, your heritage. So, what I would say in answer to that is that it's not about um, one person having a mind and another person having another mind. It's about location. So it's not about what the scriptures say. Oh, did you just interrupt me? Yes, I did. <laughs> Quite right. <laughs> just, so you set the tone. It's about location. The spirit, when he's on earth, is not the spirit that is in heaven. We, on earth, have problems that we need to find solutions to. We have a spiritual enemy who is bringing us down. God wants us to choose to work through our problems, as Bob was saying earlier, he wants us to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. That's why I agree with a lot of what Bob, Bob said earlier. He, we have to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. The co Holy Spirit is God with us. He is Emmanuel, God with us. The Father in heaven is God not with us. He is the one who has omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence. He is the one who can do stuff for us. He can send his angels to, as Jesus said, whatever you ask on earth, it shall be done for you by my Father in heaven. It's about location. We ask in the name of Jesus, who was the person who represents us. He is our advocate as a person having a soul and a body like we do. The Holy Spirit is our advocate in that he knows the mind of God as the Spirit of God. We have an advocate here on earth, in us, which is the Holy Spirit. The mind of God is known by that spirit which is in us. The mind of God is somewhere else. It's outside of time and space. That is the eternal spirit. We also have an advocate next to him, which is Jesus Christ. He is the now glorified man. He is man become God. A man with a body like ours, with a mind like ours, a soul that, that experienced all that we experienced so that he can worthily, as it says in Hebrews, he is a faithful high priest on our behalf because he experienced what we experienced. We also have him as an advocate at the right hand of the Father. These work together on our behalf. God has separated himself for our salvation. It's not about three distinct persons sitting around a table from eternity. It's about one God from eternity who changes himself for our sakes so that we can be with him. He said, Jesus said, I would that you would be with me where I am. He says, in my father's house are many pan mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. The whole business about a son and a Holy Spirit is about us and our salvation. One simple understanding of that is that God changed himself. The one God changed himself so that we have an advocate who's experienced what we experience, uh, advocating for us on his right hand and we also have God inside of us interceding on our behalf that's why there are two advocates doesn't mean that there are two persons it's a different interpretation all I ask of Bob is that he respect that there's another interpretation but traditionally and historically Trinitarians don't tolerate any other interpretation but their own what they've done in the past is they've burnt people as they did here in they hanged people there at Marble Arch they burned people at Smithfield who had a different interpretation from reading Tyndale's Bible. He doesn't want to burn me, but I, I put it to you that he's exhibiting the same spirit of intolerance. Okay, so may I reply, Richard? Is that your point? Can That's I, my point. Okay, so Location, Richard, Richard, Richard ignored completely what the no, scriptures say. And notice he's interrupting. So, what the, he said, Richard literally said, it's not about mind. It's about location. What the scriptures actually said was, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is. Because he, that's the Holy Spirit, intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. The mind of the Spirit, the mind of the Father. That is not the same mind though these obviously are not in conflict. He also contradicted the scripture in another place. And it is he said that the Holy Spirit is Emmanuel with us. Well, actually, 
the scriptures say that Jesus is Emmanuel. Yes, yeah, the same In thing. In Matthew, it says, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Now just think about that. Is of the Holy Spirit or is the Holy Spirit? Are those the same? No. The child in the womb of Mary is of the working of the Holy Spirit. Notice it didn't say that the child in the womb of Mary is the working of the Logos or the working of Jesus. No didn't even say it's the working of Emmanuel. The scriptures say that the child in the womb of Mary is the work of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son. Not I will bear myself. Not I will be in there, but will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated as God with us. So not the Holy Spirit, no, the title Emmanuel is to Jesus. It's one of Jesus' titles. And Christians call him Emmanuel every Christmas. But Richard is saying that, oh no, no, we don't have to believe this because it's all about the position. The Holy Spirit operated on earth. The Holy Spirit was present. Even then, he's wrong again. I'll just correct him since he interrupted me. He said, no. He said, no, now it is. No, when Jesus was speaking to his uh, disciples, he said, he said this. He said, hold on, let me just find it for you. He said, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. So when Jesus is speaking to the apostles, the Holy Spirit is there with them at the same time. Because it's in Jesus. That's it, that's it, that's it. Right. Like, can I answer now? Right. Jesus and then we're going to have to stop, Richard. Yeah, yeah. All right, we, so you're not going to let me answer. No, go, 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 no, I'm just go, saying, go, go, and go, then go. we'll have to stop. You really must listen. I didn't hear what you said. No, that's not John, right. John 14. For he dwelleth with you, but ye know him, talking about the Spirit, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. So Jesus is saying that the Holy Spirit is with them and he shall be in them. Then he goes on to say, it is yet a little while and the world sees me no more, but ye shall see me. For I live, ye shall live. Okay, so because Jesus is alive, they shall be alive. How is that going to happen? He says, I am in my Father, my Father in me, and I in you. So as the Holy Spirit, Jesus will be in them. That is how he says, I will come to you, I will not leave you comfortless. Yes. As the Holy Spirit, Jesus comes to us and he dwells in us. There's not two persons dwelling in us, Jesus and the Spirit. There's one person, Jesus, dwelling in us as the Spirit. That's my interpretation. He doesn't believe that, and all the people here are shaking their heads, because they're Trinitarians. I respect yeah. them the Spirit for being Trinitarians. Is the Spirit another advocate? At the time, Jesus is saying, when the Spirit shall come to you, he will be another. So, so Jesus is not our advocate, is that what you're saying? Jesus is our advocate, so he's, he's the high priest. Is the Holy Spirit right advocate. another advocate? He is the advocate inside of us. So there's two it's advocates. about location. Yeah, so there's two advocates. Yeah, in different locations. Two advocates. What's an advocate, Richard? An advocate is, a, is like a legal term referring to somebody uh, like a defence lawyer. Defence lawyer. So we've got two defence lawyers. Yes. One in us yeah. and I'm one above us. At the right hand of God. Right. So is that one or two persons? That's one person. But two advocates? Yes. Oh. And that's the, that's the kind of contradictory logic yeah. of, of, of oneness theology. Yeah. It makes a mockery of language. <laughs> it distorts the scripture. Now let me address the points that he's raised. All I'm asking for is let, 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 let me, I'm not let, asking for you to change your view. Richard, no one is beating down on your bro. Quit with the I'm persecuted complex. So, you <laughs> Anyway, so let's just deal with the, the quotes like Jesus said, oh, I am in the Father, it is a heresy, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. 
Now, why does, why does Christ say that? How do Trinitarians reconcile this to our theology? Because surely he's just knocked it down, right? No. Because Christians believe... What I'm asking for Christians believe, Richard! <laughs> Christians believe that the substance of God is the same. The very thing that the Father is made of, the Son is made of. That the Son is the very thing that the Father is made of. So Jesus can literally say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me because the thing that is the Father is the thing that is the Son. The substance. But their person are different. And that is how we Christians understand these kinds of statements. The Holy Spirit communicates Christ to the church. That is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He conforms us to Christ. He glorifies Christ. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. So that it's, a, it's we can say that this Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. Because it is the exactly. Holy Spirit that is doing the work of Christ amongst us. But Richard didn't deal with the Romans passage. Okay, well, he didn't just deal. deal. Now. No, I'm stopping. He didn't deal with the fact that the Holy Spirit intercedes to the Father and that the Father searches the mind of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit does the will of the Father. He didn't deal with that. And the reason is because Unitarian, Unitarian. oneness theology makes a mockery, an absolute mockery of what Jesus actually says. Okay, can I you just can't say one say, more thing? You can't say that they're the same person if one is an advocate to the other, if one is interceding to the other. You can't say that those are the same person. They have to be different people. You can't say they're the same person if one is praying to the other. You have to have two different persons for that to make sense. So how do we put all this together? How do we reconcile all of these passages? We say that there is one God with one substance that is exactly the same in all three persons of the Trinity. And I showed you that the earliest Christians taught that. And can I say something? You can have the last Did you, word and we'll stop. Right. Did, I just want to ask Bob, and I'll ask, ask the people who are watching, to think about this. The words, what just Bob has just said in summary, did he get that from scripture, talking about the substance? Or did he get it from the Nicene Creed? Or from the Council of Nicaea, the Council of Constantinople? These synods of clergymen who were brought together to decide what Christians should and shouldn't believe. I'd like you to just think about that. Where did he get this talk of substance and the persons being of one substance? Was it from the Bible or was it from one of the councils of Nicaea and Constantinople? So, in wrap-up, um, and we're doing a wrap-up now, so, yeah, fine. so Richard jumped into a conversation that he didn't really pay attention to. Well, I just walking past. Yeah, you had jumped into a conversation that you weren't really paying attention to. Uh, and yeah, yeah, we invited him, that's fine. Yeah, they, but they, I said they, to him, I said to him that the challenge was, I challenged any Muslim to bring me a textual variant that compromises a central doctrine of the Christian faith. And then Richard, the friend of the Dawah team, says, I've got one, I've got one. And he showed a textual variant between two English translations. So nothing to do with the Greek, so not a textual variant. It was about a translation issue. And then he attacked Calvinist theology. And his attack was those bad Calvinists, there are nasty Christians who support the idea of, um, you know, multiple marriages and fiddling people out of their money. And their sin is just running rampant in their churches. And they excuse it. They excuse it. And the fact of the matter is, Calvinists don't excuse it. Anyone who does that kind of behaviour is disfellowshipped from Calvinist churches. They are kicked out of the church. They are called to repentance. The gospel is preached to them. Richard is someone who is bigoted against Orthodox Christianity because he has a persecution complex. Persecution complex. He argues have he argues, he that? argues have, have no that, the Trinity, that the Trinity was invented at the councils, but I showed him a church 
document that predates Tertullian, that predates the Council of Nicaea, where Polycarp worships and glorifies the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Why would he glorify them if he didn't see them as God? Yeah, and I he describes I them as separate persons. And Richard says that they're all the same person. But the fact of the matter is, the Son prays to the Father, the Son describes the Holy Spirit as another advocate. An advocate to who? An advocate to the Father, meaning that the Father and the Holy Spirit can't be the same person. And the Son can't be the same person as the Father, because the Son is an advocate to the Father. And the Holy Spirit can't be the same person as the Son, because he's described as another advocate, not the same advocate. Because he will come at a later time and the Holy Spirit and will be in a different location. And the Son prays to the Father. Why would you pray to the Father if you were praying to yourself? Because you're in a different it location. It doesn't make sense. They're in a different location, he says. But they're not, but they're the same person, he says. This is the kind of nonsense of oneness theology. Now, Christians believe that there is one God who has existed as Father, Son and Holy Spirit. This makes sense of Jesus' statements when he says, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. And when he says that he who has seen me has seen the Father. But Jesus prays to the Father. He describes the Holy Spirit as another advocate. The Holy Spirit intercedes to the Father. The Father knows the mind of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does the will of the Father. The Son does the will of the Father. That means they cannot be the same person. Conclusion, Trinity. That is what the church describes in the Council of Nicaea and the Council of Constantinople. They did not invent the Trinity, they simply described it philosophically at those councils. It's there in the Bible. Anyway, Richard, have a good day. No, because I've got one question. Just have some talks. I've got some talks, Richard. Did, did those people persecute non-Trinitarians? Yes or no? Answer me. So, uh, uh, we've done a wrap-up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Wait, wait, wait. I've got some special news on Jesus. Oh, yeah. special wait, 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 bro. I'm, I'm, I'm just doing a wrap-up. I'm doing a wrap-up, bro. I'm doing a wrap-up. Yeah, I'm just doing a wrap-up. Good wrap-up, good Jesus, when are we going to talk? We can talk. I'm going to go to the loo, and then I, 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 I've got, I've got, no, I've got, yeah, I, I've, I've got some, I've got some things. Bro, bro, don't embarrass yourself today, yeah? Don't embarrass yourself today. Just today, for once, come on camera and don't embarrass yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but, but I've got, I've got other agendas I want to follow today. I've got the secrets of Jesus, the secrets of Islam. So, uh, a Muslim sister came to us to ask about why a, a Muslim who's, a Muslim left Islam and she was saying well why did he join Islam if he didn't know Islam but the fact of the matter is we know that there are lots of people who have embraced Islam who've never really studied Islam and don't know anything about it the reality is that Muslims want to discredit anyone who leaves Islam and they'll use any argument to do so they give him the Fatiha test you know as if that proves anything all that proves is that when it suits them, Muslims say you're only Muslim if you've been thoroughly Arabized. That's all that that proves. It doesn't prove anything. The fact of the matter is there are lots of Muslims leaving Islam because they're seeing what Islam is. Many of them never knew what Islam is because they could never engage with the Arabic. But now the Arabic is being translated. Many Muslims are seeing what Islam is, seeing who Muhammad was, and they're leaving. Yes, they, they're more than one Quran. I'm being told to put this point in. Um, the, fact, the fact of the matter is, lots of Muslims are leaving Islam because they're learning the truth about Islam. And many of them are becoming Christians. Entire networks of former Muslims are being created. You can join them. Yeah. You can be one of them. Yeah. There is no more reason to be afraid of Islamic dominance. There is no more reason to be afraid of Islamic persecution. Islamic Islam is crumbling and the church will still be here. Praise the Lord. We'll talk soon. I need the loop.